This morning, we're, we're continuing a, a train of thought on the armor of God and being prepared. Um, the type of warfare that we fight is a different type of warfare. Um, we don't fight with the weapons of mankind. We don't fight with heavy persuasion. And um, Honestly, the church has been guilty at times of trying to use the tools of mankind. How many of you remember feeling super, super guilty and like no matter how soon or how recently you'd gone to the altar and asked God to forgive you of your sins that you were probably still too sinful to go because the guilt was just so big. Come on. We haven't always remembered to, to let the Holy Spirit move in the lives of people, to let God do His work, to, for us to speak what is truth and allow God to do all that He wants to do through it. Hey, Betty, would you close that one for us, please? Thank you. <clears throat> that way the kids can make a little bit more noise. We haven't always remembered that our weapons are different. Um, what God wants to do in us and through us happens not because we are eloquent or sly or cunning, but because we are His. And because he fills us. He uses yes. our weakness, our frailty, our imperfectness, or whatever. He uses all those things through his Holy Spirit to speak into the lives of others. And he does the work through his Spirit. Coming to an altar of prayer and having two or three people pray for you doesn't save you. What saves you is God does the work in you. Yes. The rest of that is just trappings of the body yes. of Christ coming around you in support. Yes, that's right. But you don't get saved because two or three people patted you on the back. You get saved because the Almighty came into your heart Amen. and transformed it. That's right. And that can only be done by God. Yes. We Amen. just have a part in that. Come on. But once that's done, we are part of his family and have to realize that we're still in a battle. We were in a battle before we came to Jesus and asked him to forgive us of our sins. We were in a battle. The enemy wanted us on his side. And he can't stand God and wanted to get as many human beings on his side as possible. We were in a battle. We were being used by the enemy whether we thought we were or not. Whether we were just doing our own thing. I haven't made any real decision yet. Yeah. We were on the enemy's side. And we were at war against God because our sinfulness was at war with the holiness of God. But when he opened our eyes to see our condition and how desperately we needed help from our sin, he came in and he provided all the help that we need. He provided that salvation. He came in and did the work to transform us. But suddenly our eyes were open and we realized we're in a battle. Before we thought, well, no, I'm just living the way I want to. I'm not in any kind of a battle. But when he opens our eyes in salvation, we realize we are in a battle. And we're in a battle not for territory or lands, not for oil fields or forts. We're in a battle for an eternal soul, for each and every eternal soul. We're in a battle. So our warfare is different. We ask God to use us, to fill us, to fight the battles through us. But in order to be his good, faithful soldier, we have to put on the armor. We have to put on the armor that he gives us. I'm not sure why it's not at the head of the list, but the first one that I think of is salvation. The helmet of salvation. Because without that, we're not part of his family. We're not part of his army. We're not enlisted in his army. We're on the side of the enemy without that. When Paul was going through this list, he would, may very well have been looking at a soldier. And the way that 
the list goes, it appears that he may have been thinking about the first thing to be put on and the last thing to be put on in that kind of an order, the way a soldier would do that, a Roman soldier would have done that. But for us, in the 21st century, we don't really love the military thought behind this. We're not all that excited about hymns that talk about fighting a battle against the enemy. But it's still just as true today as it was in the very first century that Christians believed. We're in a battle. And we need to put on the armor of God. There are several different descriptions throughout the New Testament of what it means to put on this armor, to put on Christ, to put on the armor of light. There are several different references, but we're going to use a few this morning. <clears throat> from it, the one from Ephesians is the one that's the most uh, familiar, and we'll, we'll do that one last. But 2 Corinthians chapter 13, that's the first one we're going to do this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Miss Donna? Yes, sir. Yes. Help me remember that I need to do some things up here. <laughs> it's getting a little hard to turn pages without throwing on the floor. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse, verses 1 through 6, and then we'll jump to verse 11. Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, This is the third time I'm coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Shall every word be established? I told you before and foretell you, as if I were present the second time, and being absent now I write unto them which heretofore have sinned, and to all other, that if I come again, I will not spare. Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you is not weak, but is mighty in you. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he lived by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobate? But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates or failures. In verse 11, finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect or mature. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. Now move over to Romans. Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. And that, knowing the time, that now is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, or nearly over. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly, or... <clears throat> Let us walk honestly or decently, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And move on over to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. beginning at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the cunning devices, the craftiness of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places or places of authority. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. 
Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints." Verse 12 in particular for this morning. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we are to put on the armor. You and I need to put on the armor of God. We need to do that. Whether that is for you, something that you do as you pray and you say, Lord, I want you to put your armor on me. I purposefully put your armor on me. Some people want to go through that ritual and it helps, helps their minds to remember that that's what they're doing. Others look through that list and see there are things there that you and I are supposed to be doing in our life. Things that we're supposed to be uh, Ways we're supposed to be living. Lord, I want your righteousness to clothe me. I want your salvation to protect me. I want your faith to, to help me and protect me in all the things that I do today. So whatever method you might use, be purposeful to wear the armor. To put the armor on. So here's a question. What's all the hopla? Now you've heard the word hoopla, right? Well, hopla is the Greek word for armor. So now you've learned a new word. It's not hoopla, it's hopla. And that means armor, or the weapons of warfare. So every time you see that in God's word, put on the armor of light, it's hopla. So what is all the hopla? It's what you and I have to have. It's the armor, the weaponry that God provides that is His spiritual weapons that will help us to be victorious in living this life for His glory and for His honor. All right, I've got a few people that um, said some things from these passages that I wanted to share with you. Albert Barnes says, So liable are the best to deceive themselves. That all Christians should be often induced to examine the foundation of their hope of eternal salvation. I could put that another way. How long has it been? How long has it been since you prayed to the Lord in heaven? How long has it been since you have been broken by humanity and God coming together? How long has it been since you have heard the voice of God in your heart, in your mind, in your soul tell you, this is the way I want you to go? How long has it been since God said, put that down? Come on. Come on. How long has it been? Examine yourselves. Examine yourselves. The passage in 2 Corinthians. Examine yourselves. What is the hope of your salvation? Is the hope of your salvation church membership? Is the hope of your salvation that you're a good person? Is the hope of your salvation that you're nice to people? It better not be. Because if that's all it is, it is not hope of salvation. The hope that we have, we have because Jesus Christ is working in here. Sometimes I listen better than other times. And I've had children and I know that what comes around, or goes around, comes around. But I have to examine myself and see, am I being obedient to what God is telling me, has been telling me? Has He stopped telling me something new because I haven't yet done what He told me to do already? Come on, come on. 
Barnes is saying it is easy for human beings, even the best of human beings, to deceive yourselves and say, well, I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good in this Christian thing. Wow. And forget that the reality is you and I are humbled by the fact that without him we can do nothing. Come on, right. Right. But with him, all things are possible. Yes. God is not the God that we put up on a shelf and say, oh, I need you now, and then I'll put you back up on the shelf, and I'll just do my life, and then I need you, and I'll pull you back off the shelf. He wants to live in us and through us every day. And so we have to examine ourselves. We have to be willing to do that. Adam Clark puts it this way, does Christ dwell in you? You have his spirit, his power, his mind. If you be Christians, and the Spirit of Christ bears witness with your spirit that ye are the children of God, unless you're counterfeit. Oh, help us. Come on. Now what he is saying Come there on. is that if you're a child of God, you have his power at your disposal. You have his spirit living in you. You have his mind that helps you to wisely make choices. You have His Spirit that witnesses to you that your sins are covered and that you are a child of God. Unless you're not. In which case, you don't have those things. Come on. You don't have access to those things. Social Christianity is not enough. We have to be true Christians because we need the power of His Spirit working in our life all the time. Teaching us, training us, transforming us more and more all the time. That's what we need. Barnes says again, if a man wishes to know what his religion is worth... Let him try it in the places where religion is of any value. Let him go into the world with it. Let him subject it to actual experiment. Come on. We've talked about this type of thing over and over many, many times. This is why it's not okay for Christians to hide themselves in some Christian enclave away from the world so that they're not bothered by the world. They're not encroached upon by the world. Where our faith shows that it is real and genuine, our salvation in Jesus Christ and the fact that His Spirit is in us, where it shows that it is genuine is when it smacks right up against sin. That's yes, right. come on. And the way the world lives. That's how we know. We know because in actual experiential living, this salvation is working. How about if I'm dealing with that really rotten person at work that irritates the daylights out of me, that when I clock in, I'm scared to death that they're going to be the first person I see and they're going to ruin my day. Well, maybe what you need is more of Jesus. Do I say that lightly? No, I don't. Do people irritate me? Yes, they do. Come on. I get irritated at times, and if it's not Donna reminding me, by the prompting of the Spirit. It's the Spirit knocking on the shoulder saying, Come! <laughs> Bless God. Jesus wants our salvation to work in the world. That's why it made so much difference when, when the Christians were martyred throughout the centuries. And to be honest, in the last 50 to 70 years, there have been more Christians martyred than in all of the times we think about as martyrdom. But one of the realities of the martyrdom of Christians is that when they came up against the darkest part of sinfulness, I hate you because you're trying to love me. I hate you because you're trying to give me something that will save my soul for eternity. I hate you because Jesus lives in you. When that comes up against the darkest part of humanity, they still had a testimony. Yeah. 
Yes. Come on. They could still pray for those who were persecuting them. Sure. They could still love them. And like Jesus, Stephen said, Father, don't, don't hold this to their account. Martyrs throughout time said, Lord, don't, don't hold this to their account. They need saving just like I needed saving. Open their eyes and help them to see. That's where old timers told us the rubber meets the road. Yeah. Yes. I've seen an awful lot of beautiful cars. And the other day, I'm not sure exactly why, but I, I came across some pictures from the 40s and 50s of some wonderful, exotic cars that Dodge and Chevy were displaying. Some of those had fins that were you know, this big, and doors that you know opened up on the sides, and all sorts of amazing things. But I was reminded of something. I didn't see any of those in production or anything really close to it. They were really odd and very recognizable. They'd never gone into promote into production. When I realized that, when I thought about that, I thought the wheels on that car have never met the road. That's an awesome and neat vehicle, but it's never met the road. In our day and age, we watch science fiction or we watch um, special effects and they can show us that somebody like Gollum is actually alive and crawling around and he looks real in the Lord of the Rings if you don't know what the reference is to. We live in a day and age when those kinds of things just, wow, we look at that and it looks real. It doesn't exist. It's never met the road of reality. The spaceships that fly through the galaxy, they're only in a computer. Little model here, bigger <laughs> model there, but people don't live in there. Come on. We live in a day and age when seeing the impossible is commonplace. But we forget that that's not real. Real Christianity works itself out in the real world. Where things don't always go according to plan. Maybe I should rephrase that. Where things never go according to plan. <laughs> Where we're always having to catch up. Where we're always having to figure out plan B, C, and D to make it work. Mm -hmm. That's where Christianity works. And if we are clothed with the armor of light, with the armor of God that He gives us, when we run up against the darkness of the world, our Christianity still works. And we're still victorious because we come against the enemy who does not have the power to defeat us if we are genuinely following Christ right. yes, and following that's his right. orders. John Gill says this, the whole armor of God, particularly good works, he says, are designed here or intended here in this passage which, though they are not the believer's clothing, his robe of righteousness, they are both his, are his ornament and his armor. In other words, are we saved by our works? No, we're not. We're not saved by works. We're saved by faith in Christ. Yes, that's right. But once we've been saved, he has designed us for good works. To do his business in this world so that yes. people will see him through us. Yes. That's what he's designed us for. So although we're not saved by the works that we do, the works that we do are a reflection of our gratefulness and our thankfulness and our obedience to the one who saved us. We don't give our kids gifts at Christmas time.
because they're always worthy. Because, you know, sometimes Christmas Eve is some of the worst behavior children have. <laughs> Come on. And we're thinking, I'm going to take them all back. We give them gifts because we love them. Yeah. They don't deserve them, but we love them, and so we give them to them. They haven't earned them, but we would like them to be appreciative. We would like them to be thankful for those gifts, and even think about the gift that they were given for free when we ask them to take out the trash or clean up their room or pick up those toys. We'd like for them to think about that. Say, you know what? Mom and Dad have been so good to me. What big deal is it to picking up those toys? Now I know that's a fictional child. <laughs> but that's what we're hoping for. That's what we look for. Isn't it reasonable that that's kind of what God's looking for? I've saved these people that don't deserve it. Hopefully the least they can do is turn around and say thank you and say, you know what, I should, I should live up to the gift that I've been given. I, I should live up to this privilege, this grace that's been poured out on me, lavished on me. In order to do that, we have to suit up. We have to put on the armor. So, just a reminder of the armor here. The loins of truth. Loins girt about with truth. What is truth? Well, God's word is truth. And as his spirit opens our eyes, we see the truth of his word. What if it contradicts this? Well, if it contradicts this, then it's not true. The breastplate of righteousness, this part here, you and I are supposed to live right. We're supposed to do the things that God called us to do. We're supposed to reflect who He is because we live like a Christian. He's supposed to live. That doesn't mean we wear suits and ties. It means that what's inside here is genuine. And it reflects in everything we say, in everything that we do, in all the attitudes that we have. We live right. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You know why a soldier had to wear shoes? You know why our soldiers in the 21st century wear boots? So they can go where they're supposed to go. Regardless of what happens to be there. For the Roman soldier... Well, what if we go off of those beautiful Roman paved roads and have to fight in places where it's rocky? We're prepared. What if our soldiers have to fight in a jungle or running through a creek or a river or they have to climb up places where there are sharp sticks and roots, stones? It's the reason they wear the boots. Why would the Christian not want to be prepared? And what are we prepared with? Those feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We're peacemakers, not peace lovers. I'll explain the difference just in case you've forgotten. There is a difference. Peace lovers want peace. That is the ultimate goal, peace. A peace lover will say to children that are, that are arguing over something, just say nice things to each other, don't, don't be mean to each other. A peacemaker will say, what's the cause of the problem? Let's fix it so that it's not a problem anymore. Come on. That's the difference. God calls us to be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. We're supposed to go out into the world where there is anything but peace. We're supposed to walk and trod through this dark world where there's all sorts of sharp, dangerous things. Yes. And we're supposed to take peace there. Not fake peace. Not oh. surface peace. But real peace. The peace that comes when people genuinely come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 
I was telling uh, Esther and Mike as I, we were traveling down yesterday to Columbia for our classes. I was watching an episode of, of Madam Secretary and she's trying to put together Israel and Iran in a, some kind of a peace agreement that they can come to. And it just seems like there's nothing that's going to work because so much of what they're trying to do is just surface peace. Sure. Real peace comes when people are transformed by the power of God. What's going to fix the race relations in our country and around the world? What's going to fix prejudice, whether it's black and white, black and black, Jew and uh, Muslim, or anything? What's going to fix it? Jesus. Amen. Come on. That's what's going to fix it. That's what's going to fix it. Fix the problems between police and racial people that are, feel like they're being racially profiled, that's all going to be fixed only by the power of Jesus Christ transforming the hearts of people. Why? Because people are good-ish and people are bad. And what Jesus does is he makes us new. And making us new allows the problem to actually be fixed. Moving on. The shield of faith. This big shield. Although he's covered in armor and has his weapons, this shield allowed him to strengthen the defense in certain places where he knew there was an attack coming. He could strengthen the, the defense in that place. You and I need faith because the enemy is going to attack us, sometimes where we least expect it. But our faith in Jesus Christ and that He has our back, that He is our Savior, that He is our strength, keeps us in the battle. Victorious. That's right. That's right. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, or excuse me, the helmet of salvation is next. Helmet of salvation, like I said, it's the first thing for me. If you're not saved, you're not a part of the family of God. There's no meanness meant in that. If you're not saved, you're not part of the family of God. But if you are saved, then you have His salvation. Sure. Sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. He's got His sword right here. <clears throat> Arguably, the only offensive weapon in the list. The one weapon for attack. God expects us to dig into His Word. Oh, I don't like to read. Well, Lord, have mercy. Find a way. Yeah. Because you and I need the sword of the Spirit, yes. which is the Word of God. We Amen. need it in our lives. Come on. We need it as a part of who we are. So when the enemy attacks, we automatically know what God's Word says about that yes. because the Spirit will bring it back to mind. Yes. Come on. Jesus told His disciples not to be concerned about what you'll say when they pull you before the magistrates and they, they start asking you all these questions. The Spirit will bring the answers to you. He'll fill you. That's right. How? Because you stay in His Word. That's right. Come on. And you let His Word get in you. And then the last one, which is not always in the list of weapons, because it's not exactly one of these weapons, is prayer. Praying always for all saints. Yes. Why? Why do we need to be people that are armored for this battle? Because it is a genuine battle. Because the enemy of our souls wants to defeat us, wants to destroy us. And I don't live in some ivory tower. The enemy attacks me as well. There are some times where I'm wise and there are some times where I'm stupid. Sometimes where I make the right decision and sometimes where I just let my mind go. And I'm brought back to a remembrance that I need to be consciously, purposefully living in His armor. Yes. 
Lord, I want you to be my righteousness. I want your righteousness to fill me. Your right living. Your right, honest way to live. To fill me. I want your salvation to protect me. I want your faith to be my defense. I want your word to be able to not only be my defense, but to be the way that I defeat the enemy. I want all of these things to be in me, on me. I want them to permeate me. I want them to be a permanent part of who I am. Yes. You and I need this. Living in the 21st century, there are attacks all around us. And even in church circles now, we're talking about things that God's Word stands in opposition to. Come on. But our society says you need to be open-minded. Come on. And you need to accept it simply because society has learned better. Ooh. Have mercy. We need to stand on the truth of God's Word. Does that mean we hate anybody? Better not. Because He tells us to love. <coughs> he tells us to love. He tells us to go out with the gospel of peace. We go out into the world not because we hate people, not because we're hoping that I'm the only one that gets to go. Right. And I'll be really glad that you don't make it. God wants us to have a burden for people and say, I want them all to make it. Yes, sir. I Come want on. all That's to be right. transformed. That's right. No matter what their background, no matter what their circumstance, yes. because that's who God is. That's right. And that's what He wants. And He wants His church, His body, to be people that go out into the world ready for the battle. Because there's a battle. Whether you get ready or not, the battle is going to take place. Yes. The difference is going to be whether you're ready for it or not. Come on. We need to be ready. Because the enemy's sneaky, 